just wanted to make a very brief video about an article that's just been published in the New Statesman by a journalist called Louise Perry. This article is only one of a large number of articles that have recently come out about OnlyFans because OnlyFans is growing. It's reached the attention of the mainstream media. Before I start, I just want to contextualise what I'm about to say. I am an OnlyFans creator. I've been doing it since 2017. Currently, I'm in the top 2% and I am earning just coming up to £4,000 a month in profit. So I am one of the more successful creators, but I'm not one of the absolute top of the hierarchy. So I've got a number of issues with this article and I don't want to be unkind to Louise Perry because I'm a feminist too but the kind of feminism that makes you write an article that is so damning of a thing that lots of women are doing in the safety of their own homes to make a living especially during the coronavirus crisis it feels a little unkind because I would say that I, as a pro-sex work feminist, would never say, oh, I don't know why some women are poor, they should all just do sex work. Well, I mean, if you're an out-of-work journalist, you should just go and do OnlyFans, you'll make loads of money. It wouldn't be fair of me, because I understand that not all women are me, and some women would feel unbearably compromised, they'd feel as though their privacy were being invaded, and they wouldn't be comfortable sexualising themselves to strangers. When the anti-porn feminists come out and say this kind of stuff, I, f I feel like they're trying to speak for women, and some of us want to do this. So, I'm just going to go through some bits of the article that I found particularly particularly remarkable. The first is the title. How OnlyFans became the porn industry's greatest lockdown winner and at what cost? Well, at what cost? Let's find out. It says the British owned tech company OnlyFans, a platform that allows creators, overwhelmingly women, she says, to earn money giving users, overwhelmingly men, subscription access to online content, most of which is pornographic. And most of it probably is pornographic, that's absolutely true. But is it overwhelmingly women? And there are plenty of male creators and quite a few of them are in the top 10% because of course there's a massive gay market as you would expect. I don't know what the percentage is. I would say it would be a majority of the OnlyFans creators are women, but that might be just because that's the market I'm in. So those are the OnlyFans creators I know about. I'm really not sure that we're overwhelmingly women. Successful creators sell not just explicit content, but also the impression of authentic personality. Or they sell their actual <laughs> authentic personality. <laughs> I mean, it's quite difficult to sell a fake authentic personality. I'm a classically trained actress and I would struggle to keep up a fake authentic personality in the long term, making multiple videos a day for my OnlyFans. What I monetize is my actual self. <laughs> sure, my content is sometimes pornographic on one level or another, but also I talk about mental health problems, I talk about physical health problems, I talk about my own attitude to feminism, <laughs> I talk about stuff like this on my OnlyFans. It's really me, and I don't think I'm unusual in that at all, because when you film yourself in your own home doing stuff you like, inevitably what you do is you film you. I mean, saying that is a little bit like hearing someone say that daytime TV presenters sell the impression of authentic personality. I mean, sure, they probably put on their work faces, which are probably positive and not too controversial, but when I watch Holly Willoughby and Philip Schofield on this morning, I feel like I'm getting some insight into what they're actually like. I don't think they're fake. I just think I'm seeing a version of them that they're comfortable putting on television. And I really don't see that as in any way sinister. This was an odd sentence in the same paragraph. Creators are expected to message users privately and perhaps remember their birthdays or their children's names, thus offering the illusion of intimacy. I mean, I don't know who she means by creators are expected to message users privately. Only fans certainly doesn't tell you what you have to do. It's a very libertarian <laughs> platform in that regard. You get to make of your only fans what you want to make of it. If you never want to DM anyone, you totally can. Until March, I never used the DMs at all. Do my customers expect me to remember their birthdays or their children's names? Absolutely not. We never discuss anything like that. Maybe if I had a lot fewer members, maybe I'd be on more intimate terms with them. But I, I mean, I don't speak to most of them. So now she's quoting a blogger called Thomas Hollands, according to his interpretation of the data. Most of the women on the platform probably make a loss, given the amount of time they spend creating content and engaging with users. 
The median creator attracts only 30 subscribers, but she carries just as much risk of public exposure and harassment as her more successful counterparts. That's just nonsense. If you've only got 30 members, you've only got 30 chances of being harassed. I've got 270 members, so I've got 270 chances of being harassed. But I have to say, I've never been harassed by any of them. Um, so <laughs> clearly, a more famous person is at more risk of exposure and harassment. If you look at a Hollywood star, she's more likely to get chased down the street by the paparazzi than someone who's in a fringe production in London and is an unknown. That's a ridiculous statement. This final sentence of this paragraph just extraordinized me. The same amount of effort goes in for every creator, but a very different level of reward comes out. Where did you get the impression that the same amount of effort goes in to every OnlyFans creator's account? That's nonsense. There's a hugely wide variety of strategies that creators use. So I'm perfectly well aware of some amateur models who have an OnlyFans and update it once or twice a month perhaps and maybe have two fans. But there are also those of us updating multiple times a day on a set schedule, guaranteeing our members a certain amount of content each week and some of us are making £10,000 a month from it and it's our full-time job. As I said, I'm making £4,000 a month from it and it's my part-time job, so I'm not as committed to it as some people. But when coronavirus became a crisis in the UK in March, I doubled the amount of content I was putting on OnlyFans because I was at home and was able to shoot more, and I tripled my membership. So even if you look at an individual creator, the amount of effort you put in will affect what you get out of it. I mean, it's like saying the same amount of effort goes into every journalist's career, but the rewards are unequal. Well, probably not. There are probably some journalists who are more committed to fact-checking, for example, than other journalists. <laughs> and I imagine that the more committed ones become more successful, just like in, Jesus, any other walk of life. The distribution of income on OnlyFans is highly unequal, with the top 1% of creators making 33% of the money. <laughs> Holland finds OnlyFans to be more unequal than South Africa using the Genie Index. I mean, every person in South Africa has an equal right to life and rights. Does every only fans creator deserve an equal amount of money? No, they don't, because some people do it as a very, very part-time hobby. Sometimes people do it as a full-time job. So of course there's inequality, but it's not because of corruption. It's because it's a massive platform that people are using in very different ways. If you look at a non-sex industry example, the distribution of income on YouTube is vastly unequal, but it's not because of some terrible social injustice. It's because some people use YouTube to upload content every single day that is highly edited and high quality and some people use YouTube to put family videos up for the rest of their family to watch once or twice a year and the fact that one type of YouTuber might be making $20,000 a month and one YouTuber doesn't even get monetized that's not because there's something wrong with the system it's because people are using the platform in hugely varied ways. Isn't that terribly obvious? The women who post thanks to OnlyFans success stories on social media are not representative of ordinary creators. Yeah, but the painters we hear about in the media are not representative of ordinary painters, are they? We hear about the successful ones. So towards the end of the article, it claims that OnlyFans is an example of limbic capitalism, which taps into our longing for nourishment, excitement and pleasure, but does so while draining the consumer of health, happiness and most importantly money. Now I have to admit, my customers do pay me, that is true, but that would be true if I ran Pret-a-Manger, wouldn't it? But do I drain the consumer of health and happiness? Well I have to say, based on the feedback I get, uh, no, the opposite! <laughs> because this illusion of intimacy that keeps being mentioned. For me at least, and I know perfectly well for some of my fellow creators, it's not an illusion of intimacy, it's actual intimacy. The customers who stick around for long enough, some of them I become very well acquainted with, we become friends, some of them I talk to in real life when no one's being paid. It's not pretend intimacy, it's real intimacy, and I suppose the last thing I'd like to say, because this article completely skips any mention of it, that what happened to me as a professional model when coronavirus happened, as happened to many, many people, I found myself at home and isolated in a way that I'd never been. My job normally involves interacting physically with a lot of people in any given month because I work with different photographers every day. Suddenly I was at home and I was lonely. I've got a lovely husband, but I'm used to meeting lots of people. And I found in OnlyFans very valuable social interaction. I know that anti-porn feminists will not want to believe that, but the fact that my customers are paying 
paying me doesn't mean that I don't value communicating with them on another level. I absolutely do. The majority of my customers are quiet and I never speak to them at all, but a small minority actually want something approximating friendship and I'm very often happy to oblige with that because sex work doesn't only serve the consumer. I like sharing intimacy, sharing information about myself, sharing my home, sharing my husband. I enjoy sharing that with my OnlyFans members. So my husband sometimes appears on camera. I show them around my house. I treat them like friends and that doesn't only serve them although I'm glad that it does it serves me too it stops me feeling lonely only fans has served me during coronavirus not just financially but socially too how only fans became the porn industry's great lockdown winner and at what cost well quite at what cost I've got happy customers who are getting to socialise online during a time when we can't socialise so easily in real life. I'm getting to socialise online and I just would like to say to Louise Perry and every journalist who wants to write stuff like this, please talk to us. We've got a lot of knowledge to share with you about what OnlyFans is like from the inside and we're more than happy to. Please try to remember that not every woman is you. I know that every woman who's struggling financially can't solve the problem by starting an OnlyFans. So could you perhaps take on board the fact that not every woman would have your personal distaste for sexualizing herself for money and pleasure because there are lots of sorts of women in this world and I think if you want to be a decent feminist you have to at least acknowledge that every woman isn't the same woman please